Hey everyone, it's Ted from Consumer Cellular, the guy in the orange sweater, and this is your wake-up call. If you're paying too much for wireless service, you don't have to keep having that nightmare. Consumer Cellular has the same fast, reliable coverage as the leading carriers for up to half the cost. So why keep spending more than you have to? Seriously, wake up and call 1-888-FREEDOM or visit ConsumerCellular.com. Savings based on cost of Consumer Cellular single line 1, 5, and 10 gig data plans with unlimited talk and text compared to lowest cost single line postpaid unlimited talk text and data plans offered by T-Mobile and Verizon January 2024. How's it going? And welcome to the very first episode of On The Wire, proud member of the Pitcher List Podcast Network. Follow the podcast on the Twitter at On The Wire Pod. I am Adam Howe, and as always, I am joined by the 2020 Great Fantasy Baseball Invitational Champion, Kevin Hastings. Kevin, I am super excited to get this going with you. Yeah, Adam, thank you so much. This is going to be awesome. Looking forward to doing this each and every week from here on out. Let's uh, talk some baseball. Yeah, absolutely. We'll talk some baseball for the next couple of weeks as baseball starts ramping up. Moving forward, you can expect to see new episodes drop every Sunday and we'll be focused on your free agent bidding options in season. We'll try to tie in all of our off season talk to your fab as well. And we'll go in various directions, hopefully help you win your leagues at the very least, at least win your bids. Today, we'll be touching on some of what we're calling our quote unquote movable targets of the week. These are guys that we are looking to grab in the final round or two of our upcoming drafts. For Kevin, that's the drafts that you've been doing for the last couple months. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. And along with that, we'll be diving into the importance of, of keeping track of ADP and without being reliant on them and how we can adjust that to the league we're playing in. So good stuff, really good stuff that you can use in pretty much any kind of league that you're in. So we'll move right into it. So first and foremost, we've got two guys we want to talk about. These are guys that we're going to we're going to name two guys every week on uh, different guys that we are considering highly considering looking at picking up with one of our last couple picks of our upcoming drafts whether they be honestly 12 teamers, 15 teamers. These are guys that we think that at the very least are going to be useful in the first couple of weeks, if not the first couple of months of the season. So today we've got a hitter and a pitcher. Kevin, I'm going to leave it over to you for the hitter. I'll take the pitcher a little bit later and get your thoughts on that. Who's the last hitter you're going to be taking your drafts? This is really interesting to me. And the more I look at it, the more I am interested. And it, it's Miguel Cabrera. Let's just get his name out there. Miggy, we all know he's going to the Hall of Fame. When I started looking several weeks ago, I started looking at Miggy just a little bit. And it was really funny because a couple of days later, uh, Toby G, Bat Flip Crazy, put a tweet out there pretty much echoing what I was thinking and something I'd been talking about with some buddies with some text messages. And I thought, oh, here we go. His ADP's going to skyrocket. And by skyrocket, I don't mean into early rounds of drafts, into the top 400. And, and it hasn't happened. He, he's still way outside the top 400. And I don't know if people realize that he had 10 home runs in the shortened 2020. And more impressive to me was the 35 RBI for a politely not very good Detroit Tigers team. The more I looked into this, the key for me, when I went back and looked, when did he really stop playing first base? When did they stop trying to run him out there? When did they start trying to protect his back? We know that's what's bugged him for the last four years on top of the fact that he's going to be 38 years old before the season starts or shortly after the season starts, I guess, in April. But he played 26 games at first base in 2019 still. And that is a big key for me. I think he can stay healthy if he indeed only plays designated hitter. The batting average, most of his career, that's not going to surprise anybody at at 38 years old. But still a, a very 
what's the word I'm looking for? Not usable, but acceptable. 250. There's a lot of guys hitting below 250 these days. And the 35 RBI, still nice walk rates at 10.4%. His strikeout rate has climbed over the, the last couple of seasons. Still not horrible. It really got me going even further. And before I go too much further on some of the stuff that I was looking at, I, what, what do you think of Miggy going into 2021? Keeping in mind, he will be utility only probably for the entire season. Yeah, it's uh, it's not likely that he gets that first base eligibility. Back in October, for those who don't, you're doing it wrong. You follow Jeff Zimmerman's Mining the News on Fangraphs. Uh, there was a nice little bit he put in there about Miggy back in October. So just after the season or the regular season ended about how it's pretty unlikely. He may play some first base next year, but it's pretty unlikely that he plays it long enough. Unless you're in one of those, I do play at a couple of Yahoo leagues and I know the, the minimum requirements in Yahoo is pretty minimal. Uh, it's five games starts, 10 games played, as opposed to your typical 20 games played. And so if he's UT only, I wouldn't have a problem grabbing him late just to see where their heads, where the Tigers' heads are and whether or not they're going to put them out. If I see that they're going to put them out there, like even once in the first like 10 days of the season, that that makes it way more tempting to like hold on to him and see if that keeps rolling. And then there's a possibility he does gain that eligibility. But without that eligibility... See, I'm the opposite. I think if I see them running him out there even once yeah. a week or so, then I'm going to be more worried about his back. And then he'll be, as we we're talking about this whole segment is guys we'd be willing to drop right away almost as a early preseason fab guy here i wouldn't like to see that actually i think my only point is just that it depends on your it depends on the roster makeup that you already have if right. if you already have like at least one other ut only guy if you drafted nelson cruz if you drafted chris davis and you don't have that flexibility of plugging miggy into your dh and then moving somebody else into a position then it handcuffs you a little bit more than you probably would like. And I'm not sure that's something that I want to go. I don't know if I want that handcuff that early on in the season. Gotcha. Typically, do you like the discount that we get on UT only guys, even the guys taken earlier, much earlier in drafts? Oh, absolutely. Like I'll draft, I will draft Nelson Cruz. I like Nelson Cruz's discount is, is silly <laughs> to an extent. It has been for the last couple of years. So I would say that, I'll be not the first one, but I, I definitely have no qualms. In some leagues, JD Martinez is going to be DH only. I got no qualms drafting these type of guys if it if I'm getting the kind of value that I think that they're going to produce. Right. So I wrote down six guys, and you mentioned Chris Davis. I don't have him, but Jordan Alvarez, JD Martinez, who you mentioned, Nelson Cruz, who you mentioned, Giancarlo Stanton is going to be UT only in many leagues. And then Fran Mill Reyes as well. And all of those guys are being taken in the top 150. Jordan Alvarez, the first one, he's being taken sixth round. We'll probably see that move up into the fifth round in some leagues when we see his, see how his knees are doing in spring training. Then you got Miggy well outside the top 400. And if you take his steamer projections, which have him at 23 home runs and on a 140 game pace. This is what I did. I, I looked at last season and he played 57 games being DH only. First of all, that surprised me even as a DH only that he played in 57 of the 60 games. That's awesome to me. I prorated that out to 140 games. I didn't prorate it out to quite a full season. And that would be 25 home runs, 86 RBI, 69 runs scored. His steamer projection is 23 home runs, 82 RBI, 76 runs scored. So it's right in line, and they have him at 143 games. So that's about what they did. And they have him at bouncing back to a 272 average. When you punch in steamer's projections – into the auction calculator right now, he's the 96th ranked hitter with almost an $11 projection and 144th overall 
when you combine pitchers. So he's being drafted 300 picks on average behind where steamer projections put him. And it's worth a shot to me in that last round or two, like you said, even at UT only. The, the way I look at the UT only guys, are you going to have four middle infielders better? Are you going to have four corner outfielders better? Six outfielders better? Obviously, like you said, if we take one of the higher UT only guys, Nelson Cruz, Jordan Alvarez, one of those guys, then, then we're in a tough spot and he may not be a viable option at that point. But it, it just, it's definitely worth a shot. In my and it, it definitely it matters on the makeup of your league. We'll be referencing NFPC a lot, but there's obviously a ton of different roster formats out there. I played in leagues with two UT spots that have no UT spots at all which is awkward, uh, but it totally matters on what your, how many bench spots you have, how many IL spots you have. These are all things that you have to consider when making these decisions as well. And if you've got that flexibility, if you've got two, definitely if you have two UT spots or if you've got you know plenty of bench spots, like I love this pick in like a draft and hold situation because it gives you a lot more. It, it, it's so late too. It's a free pick when it comes right down to it that It can't really hurt you per se. The other thing I like to look at with these players that we're talking about is their early schedule as well. The beauty of Detroit's first three weeks is they've only got two off days. So that third week of the season, they are playing Houston and Oakland away, but they got no off days. So it's nice in those weekly formats where you have to switch out guys. You know you're going to get, he might not, he might get a day off, but if he's DHing, He might not. Like to your point, he played 57 games last year out of the 60. He could play all seven days. And that's nice to have, especially early in the season, not having to worry about that off day and to get those extra counting stats. Yeah, that 57 games shocked me. You probably remember a couple of years ago, another old future Hall of Famer had 90 some RBIs and and over 20 home runs. I'm talking about the, the 2019 Albert Pujols. And so I went back to look at how he finished the season in the rankings. And with his 244 average, 23 home runs, 95 RBI, and 55 runs scored, that made him the 135th hitter and 206th ranked player overall. So it's very viable if Miggy comes anywhere close to what his projection is or what his prorated 2020 would work out to be. They're about the same spot there. It There is a historical reference of how that can be valuable. Nice. So definitely, Miggy, somebody to keep an eye on. From the sounds of it, Kevin, you're going to have Miggy in a ton of places, unless you get I, news that he's playing first base. It, yeah, I talked myself into this the more I looked into <laughs> it. Nice. All right. I'm going to throw out a name, and I'd love to get your take on this one. On the pitcher side of things, and that is uh, Tanner Hoke. He got called up from the alternate site late last year. Made his debut on September 15th. He only made three starts last year. But he was great, especially from a fantasy standpoint. Struck out seven in his debut, four in his next start against the Yankees, and then 10 to end the season against Atlanta. He went five innings, six innings, six innings, and those three starts respectively. So right off the bat, this is a guy who... In my mind, the league has not seen yet, or at least has not had a good sense. Most teams haven't been able to see players at the alternate site at all. And I know that there's some teams that shared data and some that have not. I don't know if the Red Sox, what bucket the Red Sox fall into on that one. But regardless, he's going to be able to come and see all new players at the beginning of the season. And to echo what I said about Miggy, what I'm looking for at the, with these light picks is what their schedule is going to be looking like at the beginning of the season. Because these are guys that in most leagues, you know, like the, the final six picks that you make in most drafts, especially in a 12-teamer, or if you're going lower, 10-teamer for sure, they may not be on your roster past week, past month one, all six of them. This is definitely a strong possibility. And so I like to try to get... I, I have no problem picking a guy toward the end of my draft that I think is going to blow up in a good way early on and then and then all of a sudden just get torn down. I got no problem with that because I have no problem dropping them and then picking up somebody else, especially if I've got a good sense of what I'm looking for to spend my fab on. So his schedule, the Red Sox face off uh, against Baltimore, 
Tampa, Baltimore, and then Minnesota, and the, and then the White Sox. The beauty of of Tanner here is that he's right now slotted to be right in the middle of that rotation. He could be the th- number three guy, might be the number four guy, and honestly, that that sounds great because then there's a strong possibility that I got a two start pitcher yeah, in week the first week one the first week of the season, the first full week of the season. And if that's the case, he gets Tampa at home and then Baltimore on the road. Now, you don't mind facing Baltimore. You don't really want to go to Camden if you don't have to, especially as a young pitcher. But there's also a possibility that if he gets bumped up in the order or in the rotation, if he gets the number two or three spot just because of how it all works out, then he gets Baltimore twice in a row. Those are situations that I have no problem throwing him out there. And especially if he's going to keep throwing... Uh, racking up those strikeouts early on in the season against you know Baltimore and Tampa Bay strikes out their fair share as well. That's something I'm looking at. Do you have any thoughts on Tanner? When you brought him up earlier, the first thing I went to look at was the game log because I saw three starts, three wins, and 17 innings pitched. And this is what is the most impressive to me of course, on top of a 33.3% strikeout rate. But those two six-inning starts, his second and third start, versus the New York Yankees and at the Atlanta Braves. Right, good teams. Uh, Ten strikeouts against the Atlanta Braves. The concerning thing here, but any young guy, right? Three walks in each of the appearances. Sure. That's the only thing I see. If he brings those down at all, this is not going to be a guy you end up dropping. <laughs> You're going to end up holding <laughs> on to this guy. I like this pick a lot. Yeah. Like I said, he if he doesn't, honestly, if he doesn't get the two starts in the first full week, he'll get it in the next full week. The Red Sox have four, 15, 16 straight games without a day off. So he's going to get a two-start week early on in the season as well. Uh, so it's nice to get that right off the bat. Yeah, Absolutely. All right, cool. Good luck with that. Like I said, we'll have new guys to talk about every week uh, throughout the off season. And let us know if these are guys that you've been targeting or if we said anything to change your mind. Maybe you're going to start targeting. You can follow us on Twitter at on the wire pod. You can follow Kevin at Hasting Kevin and myself at 80 grade all spelled out. All right. And so all right, we're going to move on to the main topic tonight. Or this morning. I don't know when you're listening to this. We're going to talk about ADP. <laughs> Average draft position. A lot of us always talk about whether or not you shouldn't be, you should not be reliant on ADP. If we do, we do the two early mocks every year that Justin Mason puts together. We do some staff mocks over at Pitcher List as well early on in the season. And you can't even use ADP because we're creating it. And that's, those are a lot of fun. But as the season progresses, it's really difficult not to first thing you look at. It's like, all right, where's this guy going? This guy I'm looking at, where's he going? Where do I think I can get him? And it's really hard not to be handcuffed into the position of, all right, if he's in there in the fifth round, that's I'm going to grab him. But if he's not, it, it stinks that I'm not going to be able to get him. But that's where I, that's where everybody else is taking him. And so first, Kevin, I want to talk to you about overall using ADP as a strategy and how do you use ADP in your 12 teamers versus like your 15 teamers, your deeper leagues versus the not so deep leagues. There's a lot of talk about draft strategy later in the later in a uh, draft where especially in a 12 teamer, your replacement level is going to be a lot lot greater, if you will. So later in draft, you can take more risks. But in a 15 teamer, 20 teamer even, uh, you're going to have a lot, the, the replacement level of dropping a guy and trying to find a replacement or in your only leagues, those replacement levels just don't exist. And so the floor, even late in the draft, is really important. But do you find yourself early in the draft changing the way you draft based on ADP? Or how do you use ADP in those styles of drafts? You set it up perfectly, Adam. It's a great tool. We say not to rely on it too much. And what brought up this conversation in the first place for me, in my mind, is I did a draft before Christmas. So it's been a while ago now, but there had been enough drafts done that there was a an ADP on the site. And we were 300 picks in, and there were only 13 guys available ranked earlier 
than 380p. And one of those was Mike Clevenger. So 12 guys, only 12 guys ranked in the top 300 hadn't been drafted in the top 300 by ADP. So obviously we're paying more attention to it than we like to say that we do. Now, that who knows how far off ADP some guys were in that top 300. There could have been guys drafted 90 picks away from their ADP, obviously. But as a group, we basically had the top 300 drafted 300 picks in. And that kind of was shocking to me, actually, especially this season. The gap on minimum and maximum picks for guys is huge. Shine over. Yeah. And it's going to be because everybody is, and we're going to get to more of this in a minute, I think as well. Nobody is in 100% agreement on what we're going to do with 2020. And so this year, more than ever, the, this gap in ADP, and it's absolutely crazy. Another thing you said when you were talking about the hypothetical fifth round guy, I think there's a difference. Is it a player you want on your team? Or is it, as you said, is it a player you'll take if you can't get him at a certain point? I think there's a conversation to be had. There's, there's yeah, two- it's got a, it's also got to matter on like where you're picking too. If you're you're picking one on that wheel versus twelve or fifteen on the late wheel, or if you're right in the middle and hey, I've only got ten more picks until my next pick, or hey, I have twenty four more picks until my next pick. That makes a big difference. Huge. If you're on one of the turns and, and you like a guy, you are going to have to jump ADP if you want him. In, in many cases, if he's a guy you want to make sure you have, if a guy's ADP is roughly in the mid thirties, 12 team league, and, and you're picking at the end, so you're on that, you're on that one, two turn. And then that three, four turn, if that guy's ADP is 35 and his min pick is 29, if you want him if you really want him and he is what you want to do to construct your wa- roster, you're taking him at 13, right? You, you have yeah, I mean, the only I, way you're getting him. So I'm looking, I'm looking at some ADP stats right now. And it's funny that you say that because it's all almost not all of them, but like a good chunk of these min picks are on turns. So like exactly. I'm seeing a lot of 22, 24s like early on. And, and then you move down 38s right around that three, four turn 47s. 46 is like right around the next turn. So it, it, people are doing that for sure. And so you, you really can't be afraid to make that min pick. Just I don't want to be the guy that's, that makes that min pick that everybody talks about. You can't be scared. If you, if it's the guy that you believe in, then you got to grab him. And especially if he fits in with the roster, you've already started creating. I don't need a third baseman. That's what ADP says is going to keep going. I need this guy, even though this guy might be averaging out to going either at the end of the round or maybe two rounds later, this is what fits. This is what, uh, this is what's going to make my team better. And, and I'm going to take this opportunity as a Kansas City Royals fan to talk about Adalberto Mondesi because this is a perfect example. And we're seeing it happen, right? He is the type of guy that if you are going to draft him, you are basing your entire team on the fact that you have him on the roster. You're going after the stolen bases. Obviously we all know that his, his ADP is late second round in 15 team leagues, mid third round of 12 team leagues. He has been taken in the first round. And if you want to construct your roster around Alberto Mondesi and you're drafting towards the end of the first round, you, you're you going to have to take him on this turn, especially as we know, the closer we get to the season, starting pitching and stolen bases get pushed up even further in drafts. So that's a decision you're going to have to make. He's going to be a first round pick in a lot of drafts because of this. And it's a guy, that type of guy, right? There's not another one of him. You can say, I, I want a guy like Freddie Freeman on the turn. There's other guys like that. There's Anthony Rendon, Nolan Arenado, if he's healthy, right? These types of guys, high average power, 
just not a lot, just not much speed to speak of. There's not another Alberto Mondesi. And it's funny. I'm anti huge Royals fan, anti Royal when it comes to drafts. I'm, I, I push the other way. I haven't had Whit Merrifield on many fantasy teams. He goes earlier than I love the guy and I love watching him. And I know the value he brings to fantasy baseball. I just don't, I haven't pulled that trigger. I didn't get in on Hunter Dozier's really good season, even though I was reading the articles that were telling us how hard he was hitting the baseball and just being unlucky. And then he had that awesome second half. I I believe that was in 2019, maybe 2018. But Mondesi, I love watching him and it's frustrating watching this guy. I've never advocated for this before, but the more I look at it, including the horrible season he had for most of the season last year. It didn't end up being a horrible season, but I say that because he was absolutely horrid for six weeks. He still ended up with a 256 batting average. And and I hear this talk and, and see things written about you might get a 220 or 230 batting average. He's never done that before. Yeah, and that's you're absolutely right. In 2018, 75 games, 276, 2019, 102 games, 263, 59 games last year, 256. But all of the projections are pointing to a huge regression in batting average. And you got to assume that it's uh, it's based on the strikeout rate. Absolutely. Or at least that's a big chunk of it, hovering around 30% pretty much every year. To see him at various projections at 237, is, though, 257. projections have him improving the strikeout rate at least a little bit. That's true. At least even by a percent or two. That's absolutely true. Now, I'm going to push back just a little bit. And first of all, I'm going to put you in the spot. Are, you say that he's going in the first round of the drafts. First of all, are you picking Mondesi in the first, even at the back end of a first of a first round? I think as, as we get closer to the season and, and this becomes the case, that is definitely a viable option for me just because, and it goes against, it's not just going against that. I typically don't like to draft Royals because I'm a, Afraid I'm going early on them. It's also, I don't like to bank on one guy to give me half of what I'm looking for in a category because if something happens, whether it be injury or he, I don't think they'll ever stop Mondesi from running, at least not at this age. But if something happens to where he doesn't do what you expect, you're in big trouble because you cannot make up for that. But I just, it, it, in this instance, especially in if you're in a league, whether it be NFBC or others that has an overall component to it, it, it's just such a huge advantage, especially if he comes anywhere close to the power numbers that all of the projections have him for. Yeah, you see, the, the issue I have with drafting a guy like Montezzi is that I'm afraid that if I draft somebody like that, I'm going to tell myself every round, hey, I'm good. I got Mondesi. I'm good on stolen bases. I'm Mondesi. I'm good on stolen bases. Like every round, I'm not going to think of it. It will not be a tiebreaker for me. Oh, I need, I don't mind going through the draft saying, oh, I need this or I need that stat. But if I'm back in my head, I'm like, I got this guy. And I do the same thing with like average. If I get a guy that has a, a high floor on his average, like, I can tank average the rest of the way. And it's not true. You still need to be able to make those incremental steps throughout your draft. And I do, I knowing myself, if I draft him honestly, even in the, in the second round, or if you get lucky and get him in the third round, the rest of the draft, stolen bases are an afterthought. And then to your point, I get in trouble because then he gets hurt or God forbid he stops running or he stops getting on base at all. Now he's got the speed to be able to get him on base, even if he's not, you know, taking his walks. But you lose all of that to your point, and it's hard to make that up. Now, I, I found like there are definitely ways that you can work fab to get those incremental stolen bases. But if you don't have that anchor on your roster to, you know, add to the incremental ones that you're getting off of off the wire, then you're only going to make so many strides throughout the season, especially in a roto league. And to your point, and overall, you've pretty much cut yourself out of any possibility of, of finishing near the top. Yeah, definitely. And the, the, here's what's great. We, we spun this a little bit 
to talk about some guys that we won't typically be talking about during the season, right? These guys aren't right. going to be on the wire. But the, to your point. Well, Mondesi was on the wire last year. People <laughs> and, dropped and him weeks, like a bad habit. <laughs> yeah. And, and now we're talking about And it won, and it won some people's leagues <laughs> after they picked them back up. <laughs> yeah, and, but the same goes for it. So now I'm contradicting myself, right? That's why I'm a Mike Trout guy still early in drafts rather than a Tatis Jr., or a Acuna, right? I am not counting on 30 plus stolen bases. I'm counting on the other four categories and some stolen bases. And some chip-ins, yep. Right, yep. to your point. And so I'm completely contradicting myself, but in my opinion, he doesn't hit 20 home runs and the projections have him there. He had power in the minor leagues. And he was projected as a prospect to, to have some moderate power. I get that. I just see a more mid-teens guy is all I'm counting on. But th that's enough. If The 32 stolen bases in 75 games, 43 in 102 games, and then 24 in 59 games. We're looking at three seasons of 60 stolen bases. For full seasons, so that's just yeah, which just doesn't happen. Number to and get fifteen home runs with it, and like I said, all this talk about a two twenty average, three seasons, including the season that he was hitting like one sixty for six weeks out of eight, <laughs> he still hit two fifty six. So I don't see where that you're. It's a hundred percent. It's the strikeout rate. Guys like Javi Baez, we were like, can he sustain the 270 batting average with this strikeout rate? Finally, he didn't. But Mondesi still, it's going to be his age 26 season. that, And that's something I would worry about in the future, seeing something like what happened to Baez, depending on if we see a bounce back from him. But I don't see it coming yet. I think he can make a high strikeout work right now. So we're talking about projection systems and how they vary qu quite a bit on honestly, at least on the average. They pretty much all of them have them over 50 stolen bases right around the 20 home run mark. But looking at Steamer and they're with you, they think he can get 257, even with a 27% strikeout rate. At least that's what they're projecting. But then you have the bat and the bat X that are at the 239, 237 range with a 29% K rate. So it leads me into my next question though is that what projection systems do you typically use? At least which ones do you trust the most? And I know the Bad X is brand new. Um, just came out last year. I'll let you go into that a little bit more. But I, I know I find myself going into a trap where you see a projection on a guy that you love and it looks awesome and it's just confirmation bias. And I'm like, all right, I'm going with that projection system. Or if you know the guy's like, I don't think he's going to do that. I don't know why we were talking about him. And I look up, look up the projection and all of a sudden they're like, hey, the projection, this projection is low on him too. They must be right. And there's no science behind that. You shouldn't do that. But like, where do you fall? Do you typically use the same projection system or do you make your own? I start with Steamer. For the simple fact is it's the first one out first one of it <laughs> every year for free. I, I know Todd Zola gets his master's ball going by November 1st every year, but the one available for free on fan graphs, which I'm always on it is steamer. And it, then I try to stick with it. Do I make my own? No, but I adjust. I am one of these guys that, that I look for the outliers in a projection system or the things that surprise me. And the first thing I go look at is games played and played appearances. And I adjust that. I typically don't touch batting average. I don't have, it's the most volatile of, of the hitting stats easily, in my opinion, by far. And, and I'm not touching it. I don't have an algorithm to figure what these guys batting average is going to be. I typically leave that alone. Now, as other projection systems start coming out, I start comparing them and good or bad, because you are absolutely right. We all do it, whether we want to admit it or not. We're picking that projection system. 
<laughs> ATC Ariel Cohen. He says that Alberto Mondesi and his stats aren't out yet, so he hasn't said this as we're recording. We don't have ATC yet, but he says Mondesi is going to hit 275. I'm using that one, and, and he probably won't. In fact, I know he won't have it. These will, to your point too, that they will adjust ADP just as soon as these come out. Yes. You'll see a spike or a dump on ADP on certain guys based on the projections that come out. And a good example of outliers in these projection systems, of what I noticed right away, because one of the first things I do is throw those projection systems into the auction calculator with my league settings and see where these guys come ranked. Even if it's not an auction, it puts them in order for me. So that's one of the first things I do when projection systems come out. And it, this is great because we're talking about guys, once again, that we won't talk again about the rest of the season. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> because Mookie Betts is not going to be on the wire. But Mookie Betts, when these system, when the steamer projections came out, and, and still now, you put Mookie Betts into the auction calculator, and he comes out the 11th or 12th ranked hitter. I forget. But barely a first round draft pick if there's three or four in a 15 team league. Definitely not a first round draft pick in a 12 team league. Insane. And it's all because Steamer's projection on batting average for Mookie Betts is like 273. He's hit 291 or higher in six of his seven seasons. That seems like right. a crazy projection. I just told you I don't change batting average on projection systems, but he's not going to be that low on any other projection. The bat has him at 295. The bat X has him at 302. That's more like what we expect. That still seems like it could be conservative. He has hit well over 300 a couple of times in his career. So then there is that adjustment to be made. And to your second question, what I really like about the Bat X, as you said, new last year. In fact, I don't think it came out until summer. I, if the season hadn't been delayed, I don't think we would have had it prior to the beginning of the season. And, and I'm going to try not to get sidetracked too much here, but Ariel Cohen, each season for the last three seasons now, has written an article after the season on which one of these projection systems that are available at Fangraphs perform the best. The first thing that that strikes me in his article that came out after 2020 was every projection system outperforms the market. In other words, every projection system was better than an FBC ADP in the way that he, th this could be different depending on how you look at it, but he looked at final dollar value of a player versus what was where they were drafted at. Right. And every projection system is better than we are as a whole than the market. Back to the bat X a little bit. That wasn't included in his article. It was new last year. So he came back later and it outperformed everything, including his ATC rankings, which his rankings are an aggregate. I think he does some, his right. own thing too. He's got some, things in his algorithm none of us know but him no, but what he picks like he looks at other projection systems right. and see which ones perform the best so on pitching is, and use a little bit more they weight them a little bit higher etc you know and he fully admit it's hard to beat an aggregate as a single projection system hard to beat <laughs> the aggregate but the bat x did and what the bat x is Derek cardi's the bat and this was so intriguing to me and i was so into it and and looked at it a lot last season because I, I remember hearing Eno Saris on, on his podcast, Rates and Barrels, talk about the one thing that wasn't incorporated into any of the projection systems at that time, and this was probably a year or so ago, probably last offseason, was barrel rate. And so that was one of the adjustments I tried to look at when you say, do I do my own projections? No, but... I adjust things a little bit, move guys a little bit. It's more like I find guys I like and guys I don't based on other information, right? Than the projections. And so the bat X does, it's got the stat cast data incorporated. I don't know exactly how, but that's the whole point of the bat X. 
And then it outperformed ATC last season. Now it was a 60 game season. It was the inaugural year, but I tend to believe incorporating some of these new metrics that we know help us out into the projections. I can't find a reason not to believe that doesn't help the projections. So that was a really long answer to a simple question, but I start with steamer. I look at all of them and I'm really into looking at the bat X. I think that's a great point about just the the type of information that's being incorporated into each one of these projections, whether it's an aggregate or whether it's using StatCast data. It's really good to know where you're getting your projections from. And my best advice I can give to anybody is learn about where your projections come from, how they, like all these guys are pretty, especially the ones that are free, they're pretty open about like how they put together. You just got to find it. And and so look for that. Maybe we'll look for that on your behalf and tweet that out to you as well as to look for that. But I think that there's one thing about these projections going into this season that, that we're just going to jump right into is the fact that how do you weigh 2020? To your point, like that 60 game season is so different. 2.7 games, like every game is not worth 2.7 games, right? You can't just take a, a stat line and multiply it by three and get what they would have done Everybody loves to do that because why not? But it's irresponsible per se. And so I've been looking up a bunch of ADP information based on 2020 drafts. Obviously those happen, or at least the ones that are most quote unquote accurate happen late in the summer, right before the season actually started. So the data I'm looking at isn't really incorporating any of the drafts that happened. Like the TGFBI draft that we both did last year happened back in March and we didn't redraft just because the season was going to start in the middle of the summer. So I'm not using ADP from that because Mondesi was going way lower. For ex- Going back to Mondesi, he was going way lower early in the season because everybody was afraid of the shoulder. But then once he had all those months and months to get better, he went right back up to, I think it was like a late second round pick um, or third round pick. But on that point, there's a couple of guys that have been going a lot higher based on what they did in 2020. And in a normal year, that makes complete sense. And these aren't like rookies that came out of nowhere or what have you, but these guys who put in a lot of, they took strides in a shortened season and their their pick swings from 2020 to now are drastic. And I'm going to start off with the first guy that I noticed. And I think it's going to be pretty obvious. This is a darling of, it, of the fantasy industry, if you will. And that's Teoscar Hernandez. In 2020, and I'm using just the ADP from the RotoWire online championship, so 12 team leagues, right before the season started, he was going 319. And then after his breakout 2020, right now, he's going in the low 70s, around right around 73 or so. And so that there's about a 250 pick swing based on what he performed in a 60 game season. I'll just go down the list. Another guy knows was Brandon Lowe. 140 or so pick swing between 2020 and 2021. Corey Seager, another one, 102 pick swing between 2020 and 2021. And so are these guys, did any of these guys, did you see, are we weighing too heavily on what they did in 2020? Or are you, a, I guess, a believer? I think the easiest way to say this, and, and there's actually a point to it, it's not a cop-out, is case by case basis. And and the reason I say that's not a cop out because I hear a lot of people saying that. And then I hear the same people saying if they were getting better than they're developing, but if they had a bad season, I'm throwing it out. I've heard some talk along those lines and and no, that's just confirmation bias. But I look at this more as like in a in season, even though we're in the off season, look at it more like we look in season when we start seeing changes, is there something we can point to why they are better or worse? Like Corey Seager is the health, right? We've been waiting for this. Corey Seager, if healthy, this is who he is. Now, unfortunately, the the price is going to be high on Corey Seager. He's one of those guys I'm happy that I have (laughs) in a keeper league. Sure. Because I may not be able to draft him. and. He's one of those guys for me. I think he's absolutely worth it. I do. Uh, Tasker Hernandez, I don't know 
what improvements he made that led to a 55 point increase in Babbitt that led to a 59 point increase in batting average. This is the opposite of what we were talking about with Mondesi. He has hit for a horrible batting average with his 30% strikeout rates in the past. Yeah, that's the Oscar Babbitt, man. And there's no reason he's going to sustain a 348 Babbitt. He lowered his fly ball rate. His ground ball rate also went down. He just hit more line drives for the most part. But I have a hard time jumping on. I love T. Oscar. I've been, I've rostered T. Oscar plenty of times in the last two or three years. Um, At that price. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Took the words. Yep. Yep. That's exactly it. I don't think I'm buying into to the new ADP, which is exactly what we're talking about here. Yeah. Look at T. Oscar right around the 70 range, 70, 75 ish. Yeah. And it works both ways too, though. Like to your point, I don't think people are, I don't think drafters are throwing out a bad season. I got a couple of guys right here that have, that have taken a big jump down. JD Martinez is the most obvious one in my mind, or one of the most obvious ones. This is, this is a guy who's normally in the last couple of years, a second round pick last year's going around ADP of 24, right at the end of the second round in a 12 teamer now going at the very bottom of the top hundred. So around 98, 100 ADP. Austin Meadows, 49 pick swing as well. And I know Meadows is injury COVID related as well, but you still, you're baking in a 50 pick swing based on the fact that he got sick and or hurt rather than what you thought he was going to do going into 2020. And Jose Altuve has a 63 point pick swing as of right now as well, going around pick 41 in 2020 and just over the 100 mark in drafts. Any of these guys stand out to you and how much are you weighing a bad season? And I know you got to pick and choose like JD Martinez is very vocal about why he was not as good as he just, his head wasn't right. It's like, he couldn't watch video and you got to think that what's, what was happening in Boston. There's so many variables going on in Boston last year. That team just could not put anything together based on core out of town, just the team not producing, not having a pitching staff to back them up, not winning any games. And so there are a lot of variables there, but like, what do you see? What do you see in these guys? This is going to sound funny because I just said, made the comment that you are pushing back on a little bit here. And then now I'm going to do it. I, I have a reason that I like all of these guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, JD Martinez, right. Even at the end of the second round last year, in my mind, that was a, a very good spot. Now I didn't have him on many teams, and it was because of roster construction at that point in the draft. So maybe I lucked out a little bit not having him in the down season. There's so much coming into play with J.D. Martinez. You have, he's UT only now. And he, he, is in, he is in some formats. I think he, if I'm not mistaken, he'll keep, he had six games started in the outfield last year, seven games played. Did he have that many? I thought I saw three games played because on NFBC is UT only and they're to cut off his seven games. Um, so he had seven games, seven games played and six games started in the outfield. He had three wow. games in left, four games in right. Other platforms like Otnu, they've announced that they're making adjustments for what their 2021 position requirements are. Other systems I haven't seen like Yahoo announce what they're doing or what have you, but Maybe by the time you're listening to this, they, that'll be a little bit more clear. But it is interesting, yeah, if he's UT only. Again, he's going bottom half of your 100 at, right now, and I'm all over it. Like, I, like especially if we go back to the, talking about projections, you look at every one of his projections, he's right back at it next year. 35 home runs, hitting that 300 mark on average. And so he's a guy I'm investing in. I'll, he'll be on, if, he, if his ADP doesn't change, like he'll be in plenty of my teams. In, in the mocks that we did way, way back in the day, <laughs> I had him in uh, the fifth and si in sixth round, respectively. I and mean, those were 12-team uh, mocks. I will be jumping for joy if I can grab him at pick 98. Yeah, I, he will probably move up a little bit if we like what we see in the spring because of that batting average, right? When you have the, the power he has with the batting average, it, it's really going to push him up. If, if he looks... But some people are, we, we heard, like you said, we heard about the in-game video review 
and, and he was pretty vocal about it. Him and Javier Baez were the main two, I believe. If that was indeed an issue, which I buy it when he says that, it's something he's been used to for several years, ever since he, he bought into the way he redeveloped his swing. I think he was clear back with Justin Turner and, and him five, six years ago, bought into this, and that's when his career really took off. I, I buy it. It's part of his preparation, and even though it's happening in game. I, I buy that. And I like the fact that Miggy, I like the fact that he's not playing in the field much, if at all. I like that he's DH. And yeah, absolutely, he's a value there. Austin Meadows, to me, it's co- I'm not giving everybody a pass that had a bad season in 2020. I'm giving everybody that we know tested positive for COVID and had a bad season. I'm giving every one of them a pass. Not only is it the the lack of energy and we have no idea how long it takes to recover from that. It's also mental, right? These guys at, at that time, it was still early in all this. We, and, and even still, we don't know a whole lot, but these guys, you know, I think Freddie Freeman was the exception. Mo- a lot of these guys did not perform well the entire season. So that's my thing with Meadows. I, I think he's a bargain where he's at. Yeah, I think what I think the other thing with Meadows is just going into last year, Meadows was the guy that you were like, oh, he's in Tampa, but he's the only guy Tampa's going to play full time, right? It's like, all right, Tampa's going to platoon every position except for Austin Meadows. I and mean, obviously that couldn't happen because he got hurt and sick and what have you, but this year, you're not sure. And none of the projections are either. Pretty much every projection system has them projected out for only 113 games going into a full season. So I think that there's a little bit of that baked into his price drop going into this year. But I can't stop and think that a good chunk of that 50 pick swing is just weighing too much on the 2020 season output. Agree. All right. We're talking about pick swings and we're talking about 2020. I find that if you go through ADP, you start seeing a lot of big swings in min-max picks. So you start seeing guys go earlier, and then later on in the drafts, you start seeing a big difference between those. So my question on that and in this step is, when does when do you throw ADP completely out the window? Like when is it so unreliable that you're just like, I can't, there's no way to find quote unquote value at this point in the draft just because everybody's picking who they want. I went through and looked as early as pick 15. You start seeing on a regular basis, one round swing. And and that has a lot to do with like guys wanting the guys on their turn and what have you, like we talked about earlier. But if you go down to pick 50, all of a sudden, almost on a regular, you see a two or more round difference on the min-max picks. By pick 75, it's a three round or more difference. By pick 90, we're still in the top 100 here. There's a four round difference on a regular basis. By pick 115, or so you start seeing a regular five round or more difference. And that just keeps going up. And and there's some guys really late. <laughs> it's really funny. It's like you start seeing guys in the 400 range or like even the 350 range. There's like a two round difference. It's like they're going in this tight range. But for the most part, you start seeing later on drafts, like there's this huge swing on min max. So when, as you're going through your drafts, Kevin, like when do you start saying to yourself, I really just don't care about what ADP is. I'm getting what's best for me, no matter what. Like every question that we talk about, and we'll talk about all season long, it's going to have a lot to do with my roster more than it has to do with the guy, which could lead to it having a lot to do with the guy. We talked about Mondesi and he's an extreme example of that. He's the only one that we expect could provide the skill set that nobody else is going to do what we expect he might do. So he's the extreme example. There's other guys like that. Going back to what you said at the beginning of the show, when you, uh, the fifth round guy, do I take him if I can get him there? So you're going to have guys like that. We're, we're looking for a skill set. And I, I don't use the term tears very often. I, I think we all do that to some extent, some much more than others. And I, I just don't use that term, but there are guys where there are similar players that we'd be fine with if we miss out on a specific player. 
the later it gets in drafts, the more we have our guys. We all like certain players late. We can call them sleepers. We can call them our early off-season fab guys, as we've referred to some of these guys. But the later we go, we have those. And I think you almost have to expect, especially this year, again, these minimum and max picks are so wide this year, wider than ever, in my opinion. I, I think if you have guys that you want, especially if you're counting on them, especially if you did things early in your draft based on I'm getting this guy later. Last year, that guy for me was Dansby Swanson. I had him in many leagues. It worked out. I also had guys that didn't work out, but he worked out. But I had to make sure I got him. So you have to go a round or two above the men. You can't be looking at the average the later you go. And I think that is something important to look at there. Yeah, I think it's also important to look at some of these min maxes that I'm looking at right now. There's not only wide, but either the min or the max are so far away from the ADP that you're going to be in one of those drafts where there's a guy that just wants that guy no matter what. So like, for example, I'm looking at Eric Hosmer. Data I'm looking at right now, he's an 85 pick swing. His min is 82. His max is 167. But his ADP is 131, way closer to the max pick. So there's obviously at least one, if not two or three outliers going grabbing him in the top 100. If that's your guy, like maybe you're not as worried about losing him early. But then there's other guys like as of right now, I'm looking at Dylan Carlson, his ADP about 152 ish, but his min is 109 and his max is 231. So like that max is much further away from that min pick. So that min pick tells me that's, that's on average. Like that min pick might just be that guy's like on the turn, looking to grab him no matter what. Um, not afraid he's not going to come back, but there's the outlier of he dropped all the way to 231 and that's probably not going to happen in my draft. So I think min max, picks are really important to look at in that respect as well to know whether or not this guy has an ADP of 150, but his min max picks, is, it's a big swing, but that swing is so far in one direction or the other. It should play a part in how you're going to grab your guy. Absolutely. And it's also knowing your league mates and you don't even have to know them. You can know that I'm a Royals fan you're not getting out of Berto Mondesi at his max pick, right? He's not going to be there. J.D. Martinez, you're a Red Sox fan. Um, he's not going to slip to the eighth round in a draft that you're involved in. So knowing your league mates plays an important uh, role as well. Yeah, and knowing the rosters of your league mates as well. Just Not just watching your own roster makeup. You got to watch, especially if you are close to a turn, maybe not on the turn, I do this all the time. If I have, if I'm in a 12 team league and I have the ninth or 10th pick, I know it's only a swing of a couple of picks between the end of a round and the beginning of the next round. But if I know that the guys in between me all have their second bases filled, I'm not worrying about picking that second base guy there. I'm going to pick him in the next round because he's probably, they're all focusing on different areas um, of their roster as well. So at least I can know I can push it maybe a little bit further and get that extra starter that they might be grabbing. If I plan on getting a middle infielder and a starter in this turn or around this turn, I I know what order I'm going to pick that in. Absolutely. 100%. Great. Let's see. ADP, I think (laughs) as we outlined is, is a necessary evil in your drafts, especially in uh, as farther you get into draft season. So we get closer and closer to the end of March, ADP plays a, a, a lot more of a role and it, and it fluctuates all season. I mean, Kevin, you've done a whole bunch of drafts in November and December and January. That, that ADP gets thrown out the window throughout the off season as guys start signing, they get their bump automatically. As there's trades happening, the Lindor trade happening, like things change and they change drastically, especially with relievers. I made sure not to list any relievers on these show notes today because it's like ADP with the relievers, especially going into this season, is insane. And really, at this point, not worth talking about. You can look that up on your own time. Sorry if you came here looking for that. Do you have any other thoughts on how you use ADP or how you think people should be using ADP or not using it? No, I think we've went through many examples 
And it, it boils down to exactly what you said. It's a necessary evil. It's a great tool. My advice is don't start taking guys you don't want because they're dropping below their ADP. Take the guys that you planned on drafting when you came into the draft. That's I like that. My biggest, that's my biggest piece of advice. Yeah, I like that. I, I, I definitely, I find myself in drafts like that. I'm like, why is this? I didn't, wasn't planning on drafting this guy, but he's drafting. He, he's falling so far. Like, is there something I don't know? Is there something I should know? And I end up, well, end up going into this rabbit hole of looking this guy up in the middle of a draft. <laughs> it will lead to so many more decisions that you didn't plan on making. Because right. You're adjusting your entire plan. Just come prepped. Yeah, come prepped. And then stick to, whenever possible, stick to your plan. For right. sure. Normally, moving forward, we'll try to end with a mailbag sec- mail bag section. We'll be looking for all li- the listeners to send us in your questions. Uh, we'll try to hit as many as we feel like we have time to hit. So follow us on Twitter. It's on the wire pod at on the wire pod. You can follow Kevin at Hasting Kevin and myself at 80 grade as well, if you so please. Also make it a point to join PL plus on pitcherlist.com and you can pick our brains along with countless others on, on our discord as well. So Kevin, this was a great convo and great first pod hopefully the start of uh, many more and you can we'll be recording these on Saturday night hopefully to get as much information in real time for our Sunday launches of every episode I'm looking forward to many more of these yeah me as well uh, this is so much fun just talking baseball is amazing and <laughs> and, and talking talk, baseball for a <laughs> full season <laughs> over right yeah the more and more every day goes by the more it looks like we're starting at, at the beginning of April, and which means we, we only have a couple of months of these off-season shows, and we have a lot of topics we want to get to before we're really concentrating on FAB each week. Who knows what we'll be talking about each week, but we, we do know it'll be baseball, and I love it. All right, everybody, make sure you uh, subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen and give us a rating review. It's always appreciated and helpful. For Kevin Hastings, I am Adam Howe, and with that, we bid you goodbye.